Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this monthly masterclass hosted by CFA Society South Africa and the Actuarial Society South Africa. Today, we have Reza Ismail, who is a portfolio manager at Prescient Investment Management, and he will be discussing the topic central bank responses to crises, as well as some thoughts on inflation. So we do look forward to hearing Reza's thoughts on that. But before we begin, just a bit of housekeeping. You can get CPD points for this masterclass on Asset TV, so please do make sure to make use of that. We will be running for plus or minus an hour with 10 to 15 minutes allotted at the end for Q&A. Please do enter your questions um, into the question box and we will address them during the Q&A session um, at the end. So uh, without further delay, I'd like to hand over to Reza who will begin the presentation. Thank you. Thank you for that, Tato, and um, good afternoon and um, thank you uh, to the CFA Society of South Africa and to the Actuarial Society of South Africa for um, for jointly hosting this webinar. Um, yeah, and uh, I'd like to just start off with, um, you know, just, um, you know, one or two provisos from my side. The first one is that, you know, so in general with these webinars, we, um, the, the idea is that it takes on some kind of educational imperative. And so um, in what I have to say, it will be, you know, not at all trying to convey, um, you know, our particular house view in terms of the company I work with, but rather just to, sh to share some, some general ideas, um, you know, uh, in an educational manner, um, you know, about the subject matter and, and trying to keep the content quite factual. Um, the second one is the is that um, although the title mentions central banks, um, you know, that, that term can be quite, quite, quite broad. So what actually do we mean by that is that um, we're actually talking here about developed developed market central banks, uh, and in particular, um, the most proximate references will be made to the U.S., you know, so whilst there will be, um, you know, lots of references to the Federal Reserve, um, there are correlates of those statements that, um, with minor modification, can apply very well to um, the other developed market central banks as well. Okay, So with those two as a little bit of provisors, um, let, let's get started. Um, and, and I'll and, and we'll just outline the, the areas that I'd like to sort of take you through today. So the first one would just be the onset of the, the COVID-19 pandemic itself. And, you know, within that, you know, just an initial juxtaposition of the central bank responses to um, the 2008 financial crisis vis-a-vis um, -vis the, the 2020 COVID episode. Um, you know, just a broad categorization of responses um, and then I'll talk, obviously, about, um, you know, the bidirectional inflation, you know, concerns which have arisen um, at the onset of uh, the response to the COVID pandemic. Um, yeah, and then, you know, an important part is, you know, of this presentation is, in fact, um, you know, we'll take on sort of a look back format in which we'll look back at the, at the financial crisis and look how central banks responded to, to that particular episode. And in particular, um, we, we, we'd look at almost, um, you, you know, somewhat... Um, uh, the, the tools that were rolled out, you know, you know, in, in a more popular way with regards to unconventional monetary policy at the time. Um, and then very importantly, we'll talk about transmission channels of monetary policy, a brief introduction, and then two in particular, which is the portfolio balance channel and the bank lending channel. So I will, I will speak about these two as transmission mechanisms of unconventional monetary policy. Um, and then, and then we'll, we'll, we'll circle back to the COVID experience and then I'll offer some considerations for, for inflation at that time. Um, and we'll end off with some, with some conclusions. So, so just to get stuck into the matter, let's talk about the onset of the COVID pandemic. So, so what do we know about this is that, um, and if we just look at the, 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 ex the differences between 2008 and, and 2020, um, um, you know the differences in terms of the central bank responses to these to these crises are are maybe are, are maybe best explained by the different origins of, of of the two. So, for example, the global financial crisis hit financial markets first, and then propagated to the real economy. So, it obviously then affected confidence and a tightening of credit conditions, which then affected households. So, for the GFC, it started in the financial markets and, and moved outwards to the real economy. Whereas um, the COVID episode was was almost the, the you know the the converse of that in which you know it was really uh, 
um, you know, a, a crisis which started off in a real con- in, in a real economy in terms of uh, lockdowns and containment measures, and then that in turn propagated to the to the financial sector. So because of that, you you actually have um, you know if we if we if we just focus on the chart relating to liquidity provision, we we actually see that. The amount of liquidity provision that was um, in, in, that was provided to uh, provided by central banks to financial markets at the time of the financial crisis, um, you know, is, is is significantly more than you know what was provided at the time of COVID. You can see the orange bars over there generally dwarfing the blue bars. Um, if you look at holding of public sector assets as a percentage of GDP, um, again the COVID episode over here a lot more pronounced than what was the case of the financial at the financial crisis. And then an interesting one, which is the credit to the non-financial private sector. So in general, in terms of the, the, the major developed market central banks, the Bank of Japan, the Fed, the ECB, uh, and mm-hmm. the Bank of England, let's just say you, you had the situation where um, credit to the non-financial sector um, was a lot more pronounced at, you know, during the COVID episode than it was during the financial crisis, with the exception, of course, of the Federal Reserve now. There's a little bit of a, a footnote to that is that, I mean, the, the, the credit that was provided to the non-financial sector there by the Fed in 2008 was largely just limited to commercial paper. So, so this orange bar here is somewhat misleading because it was just limited to a very narrow, um, you know, definition of credit. Okay. Uh, whereas in the, in the current episode, uh, you know, with COVID, the support that was given to corporates in terms of the direct purchasing of of credit in the primary and secondary markets were, were uh, you know, were somewhat unprecedented and a lot more pronounced. Okay. Um, so yes, so what, which other statements can we make? Um, so we know that central banks acted with unprecedented speed and, and force to, to mitigate the impacts of the pandemic. And the actions can generally be grouped into, into three categories. Okay. So the first one, the obvious one is, is to, is to change policy rates, the central policy rates within an economy. Uh, so in the case of, 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 of the Federal Reserve, they dropped the federal funds rate, um, you know, to arrange um, the targeted federal funds rate uh, to be more precise between zero and zero point and, and a quarter percent on the 15th of March. And since then, the Fed has aggressively signaled that rates will will stay pinned at, at, at these lower bound levels for quite some time. There, quite some time they're being defined uh, as at least until the end of 2023. There were steps to stabilize short-term funding markets. So what we do know is that at the onset of COVID, there was a massive recoil away from sort of prime institutional money market funds. And um, these steps to stabilize these funding markets was largely, um, you know, a, a, you know an, an attempt by the Fed to act as a backstop for these critical, uh, I mean, uh, short-term funding markets. We do know businesses found it hard to, to, to place commercial paper for anything uh, near to the kind of terms in, at which they were usually accustomed to, um, you know, and, 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 and the Fed basically acting as a backstop was critical for the liquidity and functioning of these short-term markets. Um, and, then, and then, as I mentioned on the previous slide, I mean, something that is, is somewhat novel to the response here it was, was that in terms of primary um, and secondary market credit facilities, I mean, these were, were, were measures to actually support um, you know, by businesses directly, and we will see um, why I'm emphasizing, emphasizing the word directly a bit later on when, when we talk about the portfolio balance channel. So those are the key um, sort of broad, broad salient areas in which monetary policy you know, operated, with, you know, with regards to um, uh, uh, the COVID episode, right? So... So what we can see, you know, with this graph is that we can, you know, at the onset of COVID, I mean, let's call it almost the height of it was sort of mid to late March and, you know, sort of the early, early parts of April. But what we can see is that the blue line indicating the cumulative purchases by, uh, by, by the Fed, um, in terms of, uh, in terms of bonds, in terms of treasury bonds. And, and what we can see here is that, um, that had the immediate effect of, of, of restoring liquidity more to markets and, and, and creating much narrower bid offer spreads than what we saw at the height of COVID. So, so the, the, the purchases and the, 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 the injection of liquidity, um, and the restoration of price formation was, was critical to those bid offer spreads, you know, tapering off, uh, sort of to the, to the mid and, and latter parts of April, right? Um, yeah, so, so in terms of inflation, I mean, this is, this is something that we will obviously make a, 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 a lot more serious comments about, but later on. But I mean, in terms of the, the bi-directional inflation concerns, is it, it, it's twofold and, and, and quite obviously so. The first is that, I mean, given COVID, is, is it going to be the case that inflation picks up meaningfully 
um, as 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 a consequence of reduced um, you know you know capacity and supply side constraints, or is it going to be the case um, you know very much as we have seen where the global economy, specifically developed markets, have a significant disinflationary trend. Um, and inflation continues to dwindle in an environment of severely battered demand and remains generally unresponsive to, to massive central bank stimulus. So, so pretty much the same as what we've seen in the developed market up till the onset of COVID, where, I mean, the central, uh, you know, the main problem that was faced by central banks is, is, is that of unresponsive inflation, um, you know, even in the face of quite significant central bank stimulus. So, so which of those two will it be, right? You know, so it's not, it's not the intention to try and argue and, and, and try and force a particular view on, on which of these actual um, you, you know, evolutions of inflation actually play out, but more to offer some of the motivating arguments either way uh, a bit later on, right? You know, so, 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 keep, so, so I mean, just, just look out for that. Um, I mean, and obviously the, confer- the concerns about inflation are not new. I mean, we had this, I mean, this, these precise concerns at the time at which unconventional monetary policy uh, in the U.S. and elsewhere was rolled out in 2008, right? So let's look a bit at, at the developed market, at developments after the, the global financial crisis. I mean, um, you had a situation that, I mean, the global financial crisis 2007, 2008, they about, um, you know, had, had, had a significant um, and, fund- and very fundamental change in the conduct of monetary policy. So before that, the idea was to achieve general, a general goal of monetary policy was to achieve low and stable inflation implemented through the toggling of a, a, a short-term nominal interest rate target. I mean, that was the general conduct of, of monetary policy at the time. Um, and, and, these, and, these, and these decisions were generally, not to get too technical, but were informed by a Taylor rule, which I'm, I'm sure most of the audience is familiar with, where, uh, you know, whereby policy rates respond linearly to linear deviations of, uh, of inflation and, and fluctuations in the output cap. You know, so in general, you had, um, you know, monetary policy that, that largely focused on the toggling of a short-term policy rate in the economy as informed by, in general, a Taylor rule, okay? Um, so, so what actually happened at the time of the global financial crisis was that, you know, the normative use of a Taylor rule at that time would have implied setting a negative federal funds rate, something which was quite anathema at the time and, 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 and was immediately at that time taken off the table as, as a possible course of action, right? You know, so, they, so that was the first time that, you know, almost the penny dropped that, uh, you know, a wider range of, of response measures needed to, to be considered. And, and, and then we, and, 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 and basically that was almost the, the genesis of unconventional monetary policy. But we do say that, I mean, um, you know, some of these measures with regards to what, what then became unconventional monetary policy was pioneered by Japan, you know, almost a decade early, earlier in the, in sort of the late nineties, right? So what are we really talking about here? Um, those, those new measures we're talking about, um, using the central, the central banks using their balance sheet to influence financial conditions beyond the short term rate, beyond the, that initial policy rate. And that was balance sheet policies, QE, as it's more popularly known, but what we're really talking about here is, is asset purchases at scale, right? So large scale asset purchases. The other one was what, what sometimes referred to as a signaling channel. And that is to manage expectations of the future path of policy rates to provide extra stimulus, uh, i.e. forward guidance. And the third one was the consideration of actually setting um, policy rates below zero in nominal terms. I mean, negative interest rate policies. And, and, and as I mentioned, some of these had already been pioneered by Japan, um, you know, roughly um, a decade earlier than 2008. Okay. So transmission channels. So um, let's just get into the sort of the, a bit of the nuts and bolts of this, because this is an area which I think is, 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 is quite underappreciated and, you know, gets generally glossed over in the, in the financial press, in the financial media as to how exactly, um, you know, does, does monetary policy actually get transmitted to the real economy. So, um, so the idea is that you need to have reliable and, and, and foreseeable patterns of influence on aggregate demand and inflation. Otherwise, monetary policy would have very limited, uh, you know, you know, real economic utility and, and, and more about that later. So, so ultimately, just to make the point now is that the ultimate aim of, of monetary policy was to stimulate aggregate demand and to stimulate, uh, you know, consumption based measures of inflation in general. Right. I'll, I'll, I'll touch more about that in late, you know, um, a little bit later. 
So I'll be talking about the portfolio balance channel and I'll talking about, and I'll talk about the bank lending channel, but, 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 but perhaps first let's just look at, at this diagram over here. So, so just focusing on this, and this is courtesy of the New York Fed and it's a fairly old diagram, but I think um, I'm, I'm not, of course, going to talk about all the parts, but if we think about conventional monetary policy, what are we really talking about here? Um, we're talking about the, as I mentioned, uh, what's known as as open market operations by by the central bank, and what that sim- simply means is that it's the bilateral bilateral um, purchasing of treasury and uh, and other liquid securities from what's known as primary dealers, right? You know, or or, or to put it more plainly, from commercial banks. So, central bank buys um, highly liquid treasuries and other uh, liquid securities from commercial banks, and that increases the aggregate amount of reserves um, in, in, in the system. Now, obviously, commercial banks and primary dealers obviously have reserve accounts lodged at, at the central bank, and that will obviously pre- increase the aggregate amount of reserves. So the idea is that the aggregate amount of reserves in the system then influences the compensation of excess reserves. So that immediately uh, influences the federal funds rate, because as we know, the federal funds rate is um, an uncollateralized, overnight rate that um, commercial banks charge each other for the use of, of excess reserves, um, you know, for, for generally short periods. So by in conventional policy, uh, conventional monetary policy, this was largely the, the modus that was used, you know, you influence aggregate reserves and that has a bearing on a, a short term rate. In the case of the US, it was the federal funds rate. So what actually happens um, with regards to unconventional monetary policy, just in very simple terms, that same mechanism of, 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 of buying um, securities from commercial banks, that is still in operation, but the scale is, is much greater, right? You know, so you'd have the central bank buying, um, you know, treasuries and, 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 and other liquid securities from commercial banks at scale. This would increase um, the amount of excess reserves quite dramatically. And the thinking was that that in turn would influence loan supply. So by, by holding an amount of excess reserves, it would increase the propensity for, for banks to actually want to write loans. And that would uh, you know, ultimately uh, filter through to the real economy via what's called a narrow credit channel. And that ultimately would have a bearing on aggregate demand. That broadly is the bank lending channel. I'll come to that a little bit later. And the other, and the other mechanism here was to, was to again, look at influencing not just a short-term policy rate, but by the central bank trying to influence the entire term structure. So not just the initial part of the yield curve, but via large scale asset purchases to influence the entire yield curve and basically thereby influence market in- interest rates and via sort of an interest rate channel or portfolio balance channel, which I'll touch on later. You then, the idea was then there would be a rotation out of um, private investors holding um, treasury securities and a rotation out of them holding treasuries and, and, and buying other risky securities. That was the broad idea of the portfolio balance channel, right? But I'll, but I'll, but I'll come into that in, in more detail presently. Um, so what are we really talking about here? So the portfolio balance channel mechanism, I mean, there's a long literature around this. Um, I mean, James Tobin first, you know, you know, used the term and, and, and tabled some of these things in the, in, in the 60s. Uh, but, but what are we really talking about here? It's, it's the act of central banks essentially removing duration and convexity from private portfolios. So large-scale asset purchases reduce the return required for holding a diminished amount of total risk on the balance sheet of private investors, for example, commercial banks. So, so that sounds like a mouthful, but what are we really talking about here is that, you know, assuming covariant structures don't change, these large-scale asset purchases um, induce a broad decline in long-term bond yields due to taking term premium um, out of the market, right? So, so simplistically, um, central banks buy bonds at scale and that causes yields to fall and falls because you, they are taking sort of term premium out of the market. So what does that mean? This is sometimes called the duration channel in the literature. What does that mean is that the previous holders of treasuries would now look to other securities for yield. In other words, they would now because there's a diminished amount of yield and term premium that's embedded in treasury markets, they would now look to corporates, the high yield space, and very importantly, emerging market debt, um, you know, as, as replacements for, um, for the treasuries, which, you know, which now uh, are not as attractive instruments on a forward-looking basis. So this sort of catalyzes a search for yield phenomenon. 
Um, and it effectively then, you know, the idea is that it compresses corporate spreads because, as I said, there's this portfolio rotation that goes out of treasuries into other yield instruments. And um, what that does is by compressing corporate spreads, um, firms have now lower borrowing, borrowing costs. So firms can now raise capital very cheaply because credit spreads have been compressed as a result of just a, a deluge of capital that's now chasing any source of yield that's in the market. So companies have lower borrowing costs, which they can then use to fund CapEx. They can use it to, to invest in, in, in fixed capital. And the idea is then, again, that um, you know by doing so um, and then investing in CapEx, you have this capital formation by the private sector. And the idea, again, is to increase aggregate demand and grain traction in inflation. That was the idea, right? I, I'll, I'll keep stressing that, okay? So depressing the term premium in sovereign bond markets had major implications, and, and I think most of us will be fairly familiar with what I'm about, about to say. So term premium are correlated amongst um, developed market sovereigns. So what you found then was all G10 low, long-term bond yields compressed, you know, quite significantly because of this, you know, portfolio balance channel, because of this action by central banks. Um, it catalyzed a search for yield theme. It resulted in massive capital inflows into emerging market debt and compressed corporate spreads um, in DM markets in particular. Um, so with lower bar- borrowing costs, um, what, what actually what we found is that, you know, corporates then increased share buybacks and increased um, M&A activity quite, quite markedly. And, and, and some of the biggest, you know, sort of mergers and acquisitions that, that we saw during this time were, were precisely predicated on the fact that corporates were able to raise capital so cheaply. So ABI InBev's acquisition of SAB Miller, something that's quite proximate to the South African context, um, Dow Chemical acquiring DuPont, Heinz acquiring Kraft, AT&T acquiring Time Warner. So all of these were were examples of, of, of this phenomenon that, that basically played out. Um, and, 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 and importantly, long, lower long-term bond yields increases equity valuations. If you think about um, the bond yield using calculating sort of a, a cost of equity using the bond yield plus equity risk premium approach, then obviously with lower bond yields and equity risk premium remaining fairly intact, I mean, you, you had lower discount rates, right? So this is explicitly via discount rates in a, in a discounted cash flow valuation, but also via, um, you know, PE expansion. And, and a PE is nothing else but, you know, other than a capitalization factor, which embeds a discount rate, you know. So this is very important. Um, so equities in general with very visible, predictable annuity like earnings streams. In other words, a bond proxy, um, you know, saw, saw significant PE expansion. So all of these are... Are, are, are sort of effects that, that came into in, into play of you know as a result of the portfolio balance channel. Now, what I will say now is that um, you know again I stress remember the, the the idea of this was ultimately to stimulate growth and inflation. But what actually happened is that the financial asset side effects of the experiment became more conspicuous than the initially intended real economy outcomes themselves. So the side effects of the experiment became more famous, for lack of a better word, than the actual experiment itself. And in fact, many mistakenly believe that these side effects were synonymous with the experiment itself. Many, many believe that all of those things that I, that I just mentioned, um, you know, so for example, com- compressed term premium, lower discount rates, equity multiple expansion, stretched valuations, a reach for yield impulse, suppressed ex ante measures of volatility, all of these are in fact Symptoms that they are, they are, they are side effects, um, you know, of um, the portfolio balance channel, and, the, and these are not actually um, these were not actually the, the original intentions for the action whatsoever. The original intentions for, uh, for example, the portfolio balance channel is always must be always linked to um, its in original imperative, which was to increase aggregate demand and inflation in the economy. It, it wasn't to achieve. These, um, you know, you, you, you know, these financial side effects. I mean, this was a, uh, a, you know, a byproduct almost of the of the action. You know, so as I say, I mean, it's, it's quite important that you know you you had these financial side effects, and um, you know, it's not it's quite important also to not in fact confuse this with what the the, the experiments, you know, ultimate imperatives actually were. Okay, so that was the portfolio balance channel. Um, so let's just talk about the bank lending channel, uh, which is also, you know, you know, a, a very important mechanism of, um, you know, what was intended to work. So a very important 
path of monetary transmission runs through the commercial banking system. Um, but it depends on actions by the banks, however, to what, to what extent such a stimulus will be passed on to clients and thereby generate um, additional demand in the economy. So a textbook view of how the bank lending channel was meant to work is basically the following, right? You know, so under textbook money view, open market operations, i.e. the central bank buying bonds from commercial banks, increases the amount of aggregate commercial bank reserves that are held at the central bank, okay? Um, so when large-scale asset purchases first started, I mean, economists were largely sort of anchoring to um, sort of the workings of the fractional reserve system or the fractional reserve banking model and the associated money multiplier, um, which I assume most of the, the, the audience is familiar with, uh, and, and that's defined sim simplistically as the inverse of the, of the required reserve ratio. So if you've got a reserve ratio of about 10%, the money multiplier is just the inverse of that uh, or, or 1 over 0 0.1, which is, which is 10, right? So, so commercial banks are required to hold reserves in proportion to their deposit liabilities. And so because of the fact that central banks have now bought treasuries from them, they would now be actually holding more reserves. Um, remember when, treasury, when central banks buy from commercial banks, they just create electronically, it's an electronic journal entry and they just credit their reserves that are lodged at, at, at the reserve bank, right? You know, so they would now be holding more reserves than required. And the idea was to address this excess amount of reserves being held, central banks would write loans, okay? Now, very importantly, the writing of loans creates a deposit. You know, some, some people, um, you know, in a, I mean, it might be counterintuitive to some, but some people actually think it works the other way around in that banks lend out deposits that they have. That's actually not the case, you know, because banks don't operate as pure intermediaries. And it's actually the act of writing loans, which in turn creates a, a, a deposit, right? So the idea was that because you had this, you, the, this massive amount of excess reserves, um, you know, banks would see it fit and proper then to write loans and that this writing of loans would, would create deposits. So they continue to write loans and create deposits until they've got enough deposits to ensure uh, that the new higher level of reserves is no longer excessive, right? So you write loans that creates deposits and that brings down your, the amount of excess reserves that you have, you know, because, you know, so that, that was the mechanism. I mean, and this was the intended mechanism. However, what we are yet to say is that did, did this actually happen in practice? So let's look at this graph. Okay. So this is a graph that is rebased to December 2007. And this looks at the growth of the monetary base, which is largely reserves held at the central bank as the Navy line and the growth of broad, of a broad, you know, money supply or M2 and um, bank loan origination. Now this is, um, you know, this is centric to, to, to the US, but what we can quite see, I mean, you know, quite easily what becomes obvious from the graph is that the growth of reserves, right? I'm not talking about absolute amounts. I'm talking about the growth rates. If we rebase everything to 100, we can see that the growth in reserves by far dwarfs bank loan origination and the creation of, of deposits, basically. You know, so what actually happened here is that this is saying in a nutshell that that entire act in which it was thought that because of the excess reserves, banks would write loans to reduce that excess. That did not happen, right? That's the takeaway from this chart. That did not happen nearly in the scale that, you know, was, that could be called almost proportionate, you know, so the, the amount of excess reserves continued to dwarf actually the rate, the growth rates in, in, in bank loan origination, right? Um, so, so why do we have this? So obviously the decision of a commercial bank to, to actually write loans depends on, on many factors. It's not just excess reserves. So banks must make an asset allocation choice between holding liquid assets such as reserves, uh, highly rated bonds and so on, or earn a spread on, a spread on lending. That's an asset allocation choice that they need to make. And obviously also a liability choice in terms of how much external financing that they use at a potentially increasing premium. So banks can lend to the private sector only if they are adequately capitalized. This is very important and meet um, sort of regulatory requirements, solvency, liquidity, and total loss um, rules. So the pass through of monetary policy action is in no way guaranteed. And, and I hope that I've almost tried to convey that it will, it, 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 it's not a purely deterministic model in the sense that a central bank can buy treasuries from a commercial bank 
but that in no way guarantees that the bank will you know, mechanically write loans. That is an asset allocation decision on the part of a bank. It's not a deterministic model that, you know, will, will necessarily mean loan origination goes up. Okay. Um, yeah. And so, and so it depends on, on the expectations of banks, uh, the expected persistence of liquidity, um, and the adequacy of lending spreads, um, um, amongst other things, also the availability of risk capital. Also, very importantly, it, it, it depends on the demand side of the credit market. If borrowers are constrained by lack of capital, then obviously um, the, the, the stimulus measure by the central bank may simply may simply peter out, right? So, again, here, yeah, just uh, let me just see. This is okay. Sorry. Okay. So, looking up at the buildup of central bank reserves, I mean, it was. Sorry, I've just. Okay, I mean there is there is quite compelling evidence that the bank lending channel didn't did not work as intended. Um, so commercial banks simply kept an amount of excess reserves at the central bank, preferring to hold excess reserves rather than opt for loan origination, which would have reduced that excess. Um, and, and like I say, I mean a major factor that hampered the bank lending channel at the time of the crisis was capital shortages in the banking system. And inadequate capital reserves um, forced banks to decrease risk and actually repair their balance sheet. This was a big imperative at the time. Um, and a process of deleveraging and de-risking set in. So banks scrutinized their loan books and offloaded investments that, that bound capital and, and tightened credit standards for new loans. So, 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 so there was this massive imperative in terms of balance sheet repair um, and de-risking at the time of the financial crisis, right? So if we just look at um, you know the the, the COVID experience, um, I think I think I may have um, apologies, yeah, I may have lost the graph. I think here it is, um, and, and 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 this graph just shows um, you know you know quite starkly um, the reserve balance, the actual amount of required reserves by depositive institutions, depository institutions in the U.S. as the navy blue line, and the amount of excess reserves. You know so. If we just look at this period from about 2000 until the present day, you can see that the amount of reserves or, or the excess reserves is is quite conspicuous. I mean, it, it, it dwarfs the amount of, of 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 required reserves. You know, almost almost to the fact that uh, the, the required reserve is almost indistinguishable from 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 the from the x-axis over there. So so a massive amount of excess reserves still sitting on the part of of, of commercial banks, which they have not deployed. Um, into loan origination. So this was at the time of, of the crisis and just in the period before COVID. So I've gone through this. So if we can just look at, at the COVID experience, um, I'm just checking how, how I'm doing for time. Um, sure. Um, so if we look at the COVID experience, so, I mean, I, as, as we said in the beginning, one, one of the main sort of, um, you know, pivot areas or points of discussion is, um, you know, is, is how does the inflation process unfold uh, from here? Um, and that will crucially depend on the following challenges. I mean, um, you know, if you, if, you, if you sort of wanted to be, um, you know, more on the side that inflation actually takes off in a significant way from here, generally you'd, you'd predicate the argument on, on, on one of the, the following facts, and, and, and they are as follows. I mean, there are some sectors of the economy that may never return to its previous size, uh, requiring a large reallocation of capital and labor. I mean, one, you know, one, one easy, I mean, I mean, for example, cruise liners, you know, I mean, it's really unlikely, at least in the short term, to see, um, you know, any, any significant amount of demand um, for those kind of services. I mean, the speed and extent of capital and labor reallocation, um, it, it, I mean, the risk there is that you have greater uh, heterogeneity and fragmentation, um, and you also have the prospect now that that cash rich firms, though those that were able to weather the COVID storm, will absorb um, you know some some liquidity strapped startup firms, and that will curtail competition, right? You know, and that will in turn uh, you know have adverse effects on sort of productivity and, and welfare in general. I might you, you might find this phenomenon playing out. Um, so the pandemic could therefore sort of amplify trends in economic concentration that were observed prior to the crisis, particularly in the United States. Um, there is also the risk that COVID will lead to a surge in protectionism, 
um, which reverses the current pattern of international production. I mean, when I say current, I mean, let's talk about probably the past, you know, two, two decades or so, I mean, before COVID. Um, and, and, and is, I mean, it is a real possibility that you have an unwinding of global supply chains and would jeopardize the production efficiencies that have characterized them um, sort of the past three decades. So if you wanted to make a case for inflation sort of taking off, then, you, you know, you, in general, your arguments would perhaps speak to some of, some of these points. Okay. Um, however, I mean, the, the other side of the coin is that, I mean, what we do know is that the onset of COVID, um, Brought with it a significant deflationary impact on the on the world economy and 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 and, and, and in particular on on sort of real time measures real time market based measures of inflation expectations fell um, precipitously. So if you look at, for example, forward starting inflation swaps, we saw um, those in the U.S. for example those measures um, you know you know falling you know you know falling quite quite dramatically. So the collapse in demand has had hit oil prices, leading to lower energy costs. You have seen the idea that, um, you know, retailers are now keen to clear excess stock, which had built up during the lockdown. So you, you might find quite a bit of discounting. Um, as airlines and hotels reopen, uh, you can expect more, more, more discounting as well. Uh, although airlines, you know, you, you know, perhaps a little bit more of a complex case. Um, you know, and, 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 and given the, the environment of, of battered aggregate demand, passing on higher costs will be quite difficult and firms will very likely pursue technological solutions with greater vigor. Um, yeah, and so and so if you look at these points over here, so those that that are that are that are sort of on the other side of the of the table and and are saying that you know it's very likely that inflation could continue to dwindle and and that you might see a continuation of the disinflationary uh, you know context that we have been seeing, you will generally find that some of the motivating arguments speak to some of these points. So so I presented um, you know uh, you know some thoughts. On either side, you know, generally in asset management, you don't you don't do that. Um, you generally, you take a view. But si- since we, you know, the, the the purpose here is is to offer some, some something that's somewhat more educational or um, uh, you know you, you know less of view taking. These are some of the points that 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 could possibly um, you know be in effect if someone wants wants to make um, you know arguments for lower future inflation or or a, a little bit of a continuation of the disinflationary bias that we have been seeing prior to um, to COVID. Um, another big topic here is, is, is we have seen, um, you know, quite significant increases in broad money. Um, is this going to be inflationary or not? Okay. So, so broad money, we, we have seen a, you know, you know, quite a conspicuous acceleration in broad money in the U.S. and elsewhere. So you've been, we've seen quite extraordinary growth in, in M2. It's a measure of, uh, of cash deposits and other liquid instruments, including mutual funds. Uh, reserves, importantly, are not counted within this measure. Most will be aware of that. So, so what we want to actually show is that if values are rebased to comparable scales, then the growth in M2 in developed market economies in general is only fractional compared to the growth of the monetary base. Remember, I'm not talking about absolute values here. I'm talking about growth rates. Okay. So let's just look at this graph. So, so what we can see is this is, uh, and this is courtesy of, of, of BCA, um, you know, the research paper a little bit earlier this year. We saw that the year on year change in terms of growth, the year on year growth in, in M2 was in excess of, of 20%, you know, and that dwarfs any other number, you know, that, that's been seen that, you know, even going back to, to sort of the, the 70s. So, so that is quite a, a significant number, but, but let's put that in context. So, I mean, this, this, the, the, this piece of the graph looks quite vertical, but if we just put that alongside, um, this graph over here, and this is comparing, uh, again, growth rates, since we've rebased everything to 100 in 2007, we have the growth rate of the monetary base, and then we've got the growth rate in M2. So, um, so that last little piece on the previous chart, which looked quite vertical, um, is only this little blip here to the end, you know, so, Quite, quite fractional and, and quite insignificant if we are talking about the growth rate in, in overall reserves. So th- th- that's maybe one point to start. Um, and then, and then the secondly, um, what, what we find is that the argument would basically follow, uh, you, you, know, you know, in more or less in, in a way that I'll, that I'll paint now. So, but before that, we, we just want to make a couple of points here. When a central bank buys, um, securities from, uh, a commercial bank, Excess reserves rise, 
um, you, you know, but no deposit is created. I mean, because this would depend on the bank actually writing a loan, you know, so the money, broad money supply M2 doesn't change. Okay. Central bank buys securities from a commercial bank. When a central bank buys securities from a non-bank, this transaction would create excess reserves and a new deposit with commercial banks, meaning that broad money supply does increase. Okay. Um, when a commercial bank buys securities or lends uh, to non-banks, excess, excess reserves don't change while a new deposit is created, so broad money supply rises. I think these two points are, are critical to understanding um, the following equation. So that is why, I mean, sort of like this perennial fear that QE will immediately and mechanically lead to higher inflation is misplaced, right? That, that is misplaced. Because why? Uh, it generally stems from an incomplete sort of monetarist view of inflation, and, and that's really speaking to this, um, you know, Fisher equation of exchange that we all know probably well, and that's saying, and that's saying the supply of money multiplied by the velocity of money should equal sort of the price level multiplied by the real uh, uh, amount of output, you know. So we, we, we have Fisher who, who basically, t you know, tabled this. Um, so, so, so as we can see here, I mean, on the left side of the equation, it's not just money supply that matters. So if you were to argue that, let's say you, you increase money supply and V stays constant and the amount of real output stays constant, then of course P must increase, right? But, but, but it, but it is exactly in saying that, that, that actually doesn't hold necessarily true because V does not hold constant. The velocity of money cannot be thought of as being constant. And I will show, um, you know, in a couple of slides that of why that was in fact not the case. So the equation does hold, but it, it, it has actually very little practical value because there's, there's not a good way to, to, to exogenously measure velocity to, 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 to measure this. Um, without relying on the other variables in the equation already, right? You know, so, so the important point you take away here is that the increase in M, you know, you know, won't necessarily increase P because there can be an offsetting, um, you know, move in, in, in V over the, in the velocity of money, right? So, um, the mechanism of QE creates reserves, but not necessarily broad money. Um, and even if there is an increase in broad money, um, you know, it's the velocity, the quantity and velocity of money that may influence price pressures in the economy, okay? So what, what did we find? And again, courtesy of, of, of BCA, I mean, they, what they showed is that if you look at the U.S. and Japan, what we can see here is that um, in, in quite a conspicuous way, the velocity of money dropped in March, you know, so that that, that, that idea of, 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 of money supply going up was met or, and, and counterbalanced by the fact that, that velocity of money dropping. Velocity of money is very simply the amount of times money churns around in the economy, the propensity of ordinary private consumers and businesses to actually spend. So that actually dropped in March, right? So rapid accelerations in the money supply are frequently, um, you know, accompanied by, by declines in velocity to leave overall, you know, you know, activity little change and overall sort of, you know, price pressures little change. So, so what we, what we in fact saw over here is that you, 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 you have this idea that M2 changed, M2 increased. Why? Because you had this phenomenon of banks, um, unlike the global financial crisis, banks were a little bit more attuned to writing loans in the, in the COVID episode. So, so banks did write loans in response to, um, consumers and businesses requesting loans, right? So M2 went, M2 went up, but this, Increase in lending, right, is not in response to stronger corporate activity, right? So corporates were, were drawing on lines of credit and they were, um, you know, you know, sort of applying for loans and, 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 and things like that. But it wasn't in response to the, the, the um, assessments of pros business prospects for the future. It was just drawing on a line of credit to create a war chest. It's to offset lost cash flow, to cover fixed costs and to build a war chest to get through the lockdown period. So you have this idea where M2 was increasing, but velocity was increasing um, in, in, a, in a somewhat proportional way because, yes, companies were requesting loans, but they weren't necessarily spending that money. It was just to sit on the balance sheet in terms of current assets as a, as a cash buffer to offset lost cash flow in a, in a very uncertain time. So, so QE does not mechanically serve as a catalyst for loan growth and for households and companies to go out and, and spend more. Um, 
And I mean, and, and so, I mean, you know, and, and, and that's coming back to some of the points that I made previously, those depends, those depend largely, uh, you know, on the confidence in the future, which, which in turn is driven by, um, the strength and stability of revenues and balance sheet, um, uh, alongside, um, you know, you know, technology and things like that. So, 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 so the idea here is that, you know, one of the important parts of the, of, of, of this COVID episode was that people said, yes, M2 increased dramatically. So we must have inflation. Okay. Yes, it did increase. It increased because, you know, companies drew on lines of credit. They did not draw on those lines of credit to fund capex. They did, they drew on those lines of credit to sit on the balance sheet as a war chest, you know, as a, as a buffer to cover fixed costs because their revenue, revenue line, um, you know, was in danger or, 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 or was subject to, to, to massive uncertainty. So you did see M2 going up. You did see loan origination going up, but velocity came down. And as such, I mean, it, it, it's unlikely that this taken on its own will, will lead to, you know, significant price pressures. I mean, it, I mean, you, you, you might find it for other reasons, but simply making references to the big increase in M2 um, is not sufficient from, 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 a, from a logical perspective or from an economic perspective, um, you know, if, if you're not also uh, simultaneously going to make um, similar remarks about, about velocity, because in this case, the two are, are offsetting each other, in fact. So, so if I just were, were, to, were to go to some, some conclusions, then, I mean, I know, and I think I'm, I'm doing all right for time to, to finish at almost exactly um, um, quarter to two and leaving some time for Q&A. So I'll, I'll round off with this is that uh, central banks acted with unprecedented speed and forced to mitigate um, you know, sort of the, the economic and financial impacts of the pandemic, um, the nature and shock of the ensuing downturn will, will, will very likely mean that the post COVID global economy will experience, uh, important structural shifts and, and to disentangle these, um, shifts on demand and supply and hence on, on medium term inflation is, is very difficult. And I would almost caution against, you know, you know, taking an approach which is, um, you know, you know, which is very reductive. You know, I mean, I would generally steer away from anyone who has got, you know, um, you know, uh, you know, a very definitive view on which way inflation goes from here. I think it's a lot more complex than that and a lot more nuanced. So I would, I would, I would steer away from extremes and, and, and look at the data as it, as it unfolds because, I mean, it is to a large extent, um, you know, you know, quite uncharted waters. Um, th there were initial signs of coronavirus was having a significant deflationary impact on the world economy, both in terms of real activity and market-based measures of, of inflation expectations. And we, we saw that falling. Um, potential output will be disrupted by um, global value change, by the disruption in global value change and, and uh, social distancing measures, which will constrain the full use of capital. Um, such effects may partly offset the negative effects on weakening demand um, on inflation, even in the short run. Okay? Um, we have seen extraordinary growth in M2. If these values, so the first point is if these values, this growth in M2 is rebased to comparable scales, then the recent growth in M2 is, is actually still only fra fractional compared to the overall growth in a monetary base taken from, let's say, 2007. Um, the current increase in corporate bond issuances and lending to companies is not, in fact, in response to stronger corporate activity. Uh, it, it reflects attempts on the part of companies to offset lost cash flow and to cover fixed costs and to build a war chest to get through the lockdown period. It's critically important to, and I've repeated it probably several times, um, banks are lending to corporates, but the use of this cash is to stay operationally afloat. It is not in response to robust aggregate demand. Um, and as we highlight via a flashback to previous episodes of QE, um, a deeper understanding into the sort of the nuts and bolts of the transmission mechanisms of unconventional monetary policy of the global financial crisis and even now means that even despite the, the growth in, in reserves, that is in, in, in base money, um, loan growth and ultimately inflation didn't pick up uh, in response to those large scale asset purchases, um, you know, in, you know, by, by, by central banks. So, so like I say, I've, 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 I've mostly, um, I mean, that's basically the end of the presentation. Um, like I said, I've, I've alluded mostly to, to, to the U.S., but, but what I can say is that there are correlates of these arguments that can be made for the other major, um, um developed markets, central banks as well.
mm. we've, we've engaged in, in similar, uh, if not almost identical um, activity with regards to certainly large scale asset purchases, um, forward guidance and the lowering of, of, of policy rates to, to, to very accommodative levels. So, so I mean, yes, yeah, so, so towards the end, I just offered some, some thoughts about inflation. Obviously, they are not exhaustive and obviously they are not meant to, to push a, a, a particular view, um, you know, the, the, down the throats of the audience. It's, it's mainly to sort of give some of the, some of the motivating ideas that have been forwarded on either side um, of, 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 let's call this inflation argument, it is inflation process divide and, 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 and how it, it could evolve um, going forward. Um, so I think that, that that's pretty much it in terms of the presentation. Um, I, hope, I hope it's been um, somewhat useful, um, obviously not, not exhaustive, as I said, and um, I'm happy to take um, any questions, um, um, if, if they are from, from the, the, those that have um, dialed in and watched from home. Cool. Okay. Reza, thank you a lot for that informative presentation. I'm sure the audience did enjoy delving into some of the um, some of the elements which you did highlight. Uh, I would like to obviously begin the, the Q and A um, session just by reminding the audience uh, you can type in questions uh, on your screen, and those will appear on my end, and I will facilitate those those questions for Reza. So while you uh, go about uh, thinking or typing your questions, uh, perhaps I'll just start with with one question. Uh, Reza, just in terms of um, transmission mechanisms, and you did obviously focus on the U.S., but generally what is your view in terms of the, the end recipient um, being either the, um, the banking system versus the um, perhaps uh, direct uh, intended recipient at the end, whether it is employees um, or uh, so on and so forth? Um, is it really on a case by case basis in terms of different um, financial systems and and needs identified um, by the policymakers, or do you think that there is a general best practice in terms of uh, who to target uh, in that regard? Yeah, so so like I mean, an, an important point for there was that I mean, um, you know, in, and and I, and I think this this point gets gets lost along the way quite often is that. Ultimately, when, when, when these measures were conceived, it was really to, first of all, uh, an initial part of it was, 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 was to, um, you know, um, restore confidence, restore liquidity, restore, restore price formation. But ultimately, you had a problem with aggregate demand. You, 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 you had these measures that were meant to address the real economy, right? The, 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 the end recipient there was you, you had to have the case where ordinary private consumers and businesses um, you know, it, it increased their propensity to want to spend, and it increased their propensity to want to embark on capital formation. That was that was the ultimate objective of these things, as I said throughout the, the presentation. But now, did it actually achieve that? I would I would say no, right? You know, and and the reason and the reason I think there's and and this has been getting a lot of coverage of that. There's always this talk about this bifurcation between the between Main Street and Wall Street, right? The fact that you've got this, you know, this massive um, stuttering real economy and you've got a flying financial system, right? So what actually happened by these, uh, these unconventional policies, um, and like I say, the side effects of these things actually became more, more, more conspicuous and more famous than the experiment. So what actually happened is the financial asset implications of, actu of monetary policy became extremely pronounced. You know, risk assets took off and reached the stratosphere. But the ordinary blue collar worker that was maybe looking to, um, you know, to, to potentially spend more, um, his life was perhaps not changed in a meaningful way, right? So the real economy consequences of unconventional monetary policy were, uh, you know, there was still a lot to be desired on that side. The financial asset side was massive, right? And I think in terms of your question, and I think in general, that was, that was the narrative that one could superimpose on most of the developed world economies. You had a very pronounced financial asset consequences, but in terms of the ultimate filtering down to ordinary, you know, private consumer aggregate demand and, and the, the increasing their propensity to spend, um, you, you actually didn't find that, you know, um, it, 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 they, they, they will remain this, this bifurcation between the real economy and, um, and, 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 and Wall Street, basically. 
Um, and yes, I think it, it I mean, I mean, it, it is on a, on a case by case basis. I mean, like, you know, if I would just to draw, you know, a parallel to, to, to South Africa, I mean, there again, I mean, you, 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 you have this case where, as we know, um, for example, um, policy rates are, are, have been lowered by 300 basis points this year. Okay. Um, the, the nominal repo is at an all time low, but do we see capital formation? No, we don't. So it actually tells you that the cost of capital is not the only consideration that could lead to capital formation. A big part of it is confidence and a big part of it is the resolution of uncertainty. It's not just the availability of money, right? You know, so that is an important part. And it's important to realize that that, that loop is not deterministic. It's not a given that by lowering policy rates, you will have capital formation. It's not. It's not a given that by lowering policy rates you will increase aggregate demand. It's you know that those are those are multivariable decisions that consumers make, taking all sorts of things into account. Um, so so very much like that, it, you know, it, it was a case um, you know in, in in developed market economies where you, where you didn't find that necessarily you you got that traction in inflation and you got that traction in um, in aggregate demand ultimately. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks thanks for that answer, Reza. I couldn't agree more. Um, the policy rates are just uh, uh, the denominator part of the, the overall equation. And confidence will, will return when people's future expectations of cash flows and growth uh, start to improve. Yeah. Uh, if we go to our first question, uh, which has come through from Malik Shehu, and his question is, is there a chance that the QE made investors confident? in that the investors thought that it is now time to buy. If you say that the QE was done to improve the war chest of companies, could it have been a signal for a bullish market? Okay, so there's a few things there. Um, right, so so let's just talk about the war chest spot. So so so, so that war chest spot, what I, what I was trying to, to get there was that um, in the financial crisis, you, you really didn't find loan origination, okay, um, in, a, in a proportionate way, proportionate to the growth in excess reserves, okay? So that was the financial crisis. So you didn't really have loan origination. In the current COVID episode, we are seeing loan origination, right? You know, but is that going to necessarily translate into companies investing into fixed capital? The answer is no, Right because they've simply drawn on lines of credit and applied for a loan simply to increase their cash buffers. They have no intention of building a second factory or investing in a fixed asset. Simply want to keep that cash on the balance sheet because they are just so certain about the revenue line, right? So so, so, so that's the part about the war chest. Now, um, did, did, did QE make investors confident? Okay, so, so what happened actually in QE is with, with, with regards to, to wanting to invest or, or go out and, and buy financial assets is that you had this phenomenon of a greater fool theory. Okay, so what does that say? Basically, it says that the fundamentals underpinning an asset price are almost ir irrelevant as long as I know that I'm going to be able to, I can buy an asset at any price, however dislocated it is from fundamentals. I can buy an asset at any price as long as I know there will be a greater fool down the road that I can sell this asset to at a higher price. That's the only reason that, you know, people would buy bonds. I mean, like, or at least one of the reasons why people would buy, um, you know, you know, quite expensive equities or equities on stretched multiples if they believe that this trend that had, that had led to those extreme, that those, that those, um, expanded multiples, that that trend will continue, that the trend of bond buying by central banks will continue. So if you buy it, uh, a, a, a bond um, at a very, very low yield, uh, the expectation is that that, lead, that yield could get even stronger and even lower and you can make a capital gain. So what it did lead to was this idea that almost the initial purchase price of a financial asset almost didn't matter. You, know, you had this class of almost price agnostic investors that were just conscious of the fact that with increased intervention by central banks, you would have asset prices that rise to even higher and higher levels completely dislocated by fu to, to fundamentals, but you just know that you'll be able to sell this asset at a higher price and make a profit. You know, so this kind of thinking, you know, you know, you find that in many sectors of, of the market. So, 
So yes, there was a confidence channel, um, you, you know, to QE. Um, I, I, if I could answer something about that question. Thanks, thanks for that, Reza. And while we wait for further questions, um, if you allow me, just uh, another question. Uh, and I mean, you have touched on obviously uh, quite a bit on, on yields. And I mean, if we bring you know an EM DM, uh, I suppose. Uh, Look into 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 the mix. Uh, what, I mean, what is your your view now on investors um, looking for yield, irrespective of, for example, underlying fundamentals? And we could be talking about, for instance, the uh, the euro bond market with a lot of African issuers uh, who might uh, be close to default. Yet um, we have still seen healthy appetite throughout um, the curve coronavirus period um, for these bonds and um, obviously you touched on, on corporate bonds as well um, and I mean yields on um, high yield debt um, compressing as well and all of this uh, due to the search for yield. Just what are your, your thoughts on that? Yeah, so yeah. I mean the- it's very, I mean, very important. I mean, like, so, 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 so what we know about, um, you, you know, there was, there was, there was a piece I, 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 um, I read recently and, um, I think the, the source evades me for now. But I mean, if we just look at the, the traditional place of, of bonds in a portfolio, I mean, they, they, they generally served a twofold purpose. And the first one was, um, effectively they were, uh, they, 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 they provide an income. And the secondly is that um, in, in decades of past, they, they almost provided a haven status. So, so what used to happen in general was that you could get a, a running yield, a cash flow yield from a bond. And also you, you, you almost had the knowledge in the back of your mind that if things were to turn pear-shaped in terms of global investment markets, that the bond would see price appreciation in the, in the forms of, of strengthening yields. This was in decades of past, right? So that first, that first attractive feature of why bonds should be in the, in a portfolio in the first place has been totally decimated, right? So bonds in the developed market at least, um, provide no yield. You don't, you, you can't get any sort of reasonable income by making a, a reasonable coupon income by making bonds, uh, giving the bonds a prominence in a portfolio as what it once had, right? So now you know, the question means that, so, so where do you get yield from? Okay. So at the moment, um, the, you, know, you know, prior to coronavirus, that answer was emerging markets, right? And what we found that if you look at the South African context, for example, you actually find that um, other than Nenegate, right, other than Nenegate, you found that in all of the other sort of like political shenanigans that happened, we, we, we actually saw robust inflows into our sovereign bond market in a, almost, in a way that almost indicated global capital was politically agnostic to whatever was happening on the ground, but the fact that you could get a reasonable high, a reasonably high real yield on a currency adjusted basis meant that you would get influx of, of capital coming into our markets. I mean, the, the, I mean, the, the amount of, 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 of non-residence, um, ownership of our bond market is quite prominent. It's amongst the highest uh, in the EM space in general. Um, it has come off of late, but, but in general, um, my view is that when, when, when the, you know, when the uncertainty around COVID dissipates somewhat, right, you will, you will most definitely see a, 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 um, a resumption of global capital going into emerging markets because there's no other way to back developed market liabilities in terms of coupon income, right? There's no, there's no other way to get, there's no other way to secure that in the developed world market world. You have to look towards EM. It's just basically a confluence of factors now where uncertainty is just so high and you don't know the extent at which emerging market currencies could ostensibly sell off that global, um, you know, hard currency capital is not actually piling into the South African, into South Africa, Poland, Hungary, Brazil, those, the, those kind of areas. So, so the search for yield will definitely resume. And because you, because you've now taken EMs off the table, where else can you now look for yield? You can look in the corporate high yield market in your own economy, right? And that has meant that because I can't look at the Poland, Hungary, South Africa anymore, if I need to get coupon income from somewhere, I have to now look to the very dicey parts of the high yield market in, in, in the US, as you said, to try and eke out some yield. And this phenomenon will continue. Right. This phenomenon will continue until at such time as which, I mean, you, you really have a little bit more certainty on COVID. And if we look at the you know, Western Europe now, 
it doesn't look at that it doesn't look as though that certainty is within touching distance. I mean, France just last night affected another, um, you, you know, hard lockdown. So, so I think that would be the answer. So you, you will see an increase in that general phenomenon where you're looking for, for yield in other places simply because you don't get coupon income from developed market bond markets um, uh, anymore. Thank you for that, Reza. And uh, we haven't had any new questions coming through, so I assume that Reza's comprehensive presentation did touch on most of the areas that, that people wanted to wanted to delve into. Um, so since that we have reached 2 p.m., unless anyone is busy typing furiously at the moment, uh, a follow-up question, we, we will give you a, a few seconds, otherwise uh, we will bring proceedings to a close. So if there is someone out there busy finalizing a question, please, please do so. Uh, we'll wait um, 10, 15 seconds or so, and if not, then we will bring proceedings to a close. I think everyone's tucking into their lunch uh, title, so. That is a good point. <laughs> yeah. I did factor that into my, uh, uh, my, my previous statement. So uh, given that uh, lunch is imminent, um, we will have to cut off anyone who may have been in the middle of a sentence. Um, so unfortunately, unfortunately uh, we won't be able to, to cover that. But if uh, there are any follow-up questions, please do email them through to us um, at info. Uh, um, at cfa.ac.za, and we will forward them on to, to Reza, who uh, will then provide us with some feedback. But um, just in closing, thanks. Um, thank you to Reza for the presentation and for sharing your insights with us. And on behalf of CFA Society South Africa and Actuarial Society South Africa, um, we will bring this masterclass to a close. So thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day. Keep well and stay safe. Thanks very much to you, Tato, and to the CFS Society South Africa, the Actual Society, and to everyone that has tuned in for this webinar. Thanks, and have a great day further.